So, 1519 Leipzig, and here's what the deal was. This destabilized the entire empire, and this destabilized the emperor, Charles V. Now, we'll get to a little bit more of that, but what, the, what Luther said was only the Bible. and not the church should tell, not the church dogma, and not the ministers. And German princes looked at this and said, this was a way for us to leave the authority of the church in the emperor. This would eventually trigger a civil war that's gonna take place in Central Europe and will not end till 1648. There's going to be horrific fighting, an uneasy truce, and then the most god-awful war you can imagine, the Thirty Years' War. And now, do you remember the term where you take an historical event that's happening right now and relate it to something that either happens in the future or happened in the past? Do you remember what that's called? Take something that's happening right now and relate it. Anybody remember? We might need another historical thinking skill to put us, but not matching, huh? Probably. Context is what happens during that time. So context. And so you could argue that the context of Luther would be the Renaissance just happened, the development of the printing press, and also exploration and a dramatic change in Europe. But relating it to another thing was, or is called, synthesis. And synthesis is something all of you need to know. If you looked at me and just sort of, if you did not remember that, because some of you remember it in one say, but if you did not remember that, you damn well better write it down now. Put a little asterisk by it, because that's something you need to remember. Synthesis. And the thing about synthesis is this. This is going to directly relate the religious war starting right here to the basis of the idea of a constitution, a country of laws, including what happened in the United States. The religious wars that happened then, the, it's the reason why the constitution of the United States is very clear. There will be no religious test for office. And eventually it would be dubbed a separation of church and state. They saw the Founding Fathers of the United States saw what happened with religious conflict and they want to make sure that the United States will not, the government will not be based upon religious ideas. The government will be completely secular. So, a little asterisk there, jot that down. These religious wars. Is that reason why? So when they wrote the Constitution, they were very, very worried about it. There's a couple other things about it, but it's very clear. There can be no religious test for office. There will not be a state religion in the United States. And that is why we can't do overt religious activities in public facilities like schools. There can be some little things, but I can't order you to pray, to pray. Now, you can pray all the time to yourself. You can pray right now that the state is over. You can pray that you don't take another test again. You can do all that kind of stuff, whatever you want to, but I can't make it. So, back to this. So that is synthesis. And so Luther was very, very worried about this. And the Pope then issued what's called a papal bull. A papal bull, actually he's done two, but a papal bull is a document where the Pope gives an order. And in this order, not only did the Pope tell Luther to quit and recant, but then he would excommunicate Luther. And excommunicate meant you're going to, means you're going to hell. This was a big step at a time where hell was incredibly real to people. And so to backtrack just a little bit, that's Luther burning the papal bull. The Pope has spoken and Luther is saying the Pope has no authority. And once that happened, you have the beginnings of a nasty civil war. And so, with the printing press, 
which started here. All these areas now have printing press. All these areas have the beginnings of a modern business. What's the business? Printing stuff. And it spread quickly. The printing press, then Luther. So, in 1523, Luther would write his translation of the Bible in the vernacular. And so, got to get that down. His translation of the Bible. That is the printing press in Mons, but it's one of the printing press that did it. That is an original copy of this, of Luther's <coughs> first edition. They, they had one in Bozeman for a while. They had kind of a traveling expedition. 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 Yeah, they're, they're exploring Bozeman. An exhibition there, and it's really cool. And they have one, one in the, the, the London, or the, the British Library. They have one in the Smithsonian. They have one in a few other places. And they're, they're pretty amazing. They still printed them, but then they still did the medieval practice. They would go back and draw things in the margins. So you have all these weird, surreal pictures in the margin. It's pretty funny. They don't let you take this home. They let you sign it, though, so you can autograph it. But here's why we have to get the vernacular. This Bible was so popular that Luther's version of German became the German that everyone uses to this day. It's Luther. High German was Luther's translation. And so if you so anybody taking German? German is Luther. Are you taking it? Who's taking it? And this is really important because with this, Luther created a German identity. And so we have to get that down. Those who speak German speaking or talking, at least formally, in Luther's high German, start more and more to consider themselves to be Germans. Calvin would do the same thing for the French. It would happen in England. The vernacular gave people a national identity. More and more, those of us who speak this language have a common background, a common ancestry. And this would begin the concept of nationalism. Nationalism. Nationalism is the desire of people of the same basic national identity, aka language, to begin to want their own country. They begin to want their own country and this concept of national pride. There must be something special about Germans because we all speak the same language. There must be something special about French because we speak French. Now it's gonna take a couple hundred years for this to really take place, really become important. You can see it really happening with the French Revolution and the Napoleonic era, but it all starts here. And just as leaving. Now backtrack just a little bit. The Diet of Worms of 1521. And one thing I'm really trying to do, I have a bad habit of kind of starting to tell my story, and I never really explain to you exactly what you put down, so I'm making sure I do this. I put down the title, then we can write things down. I kind of start telling something, and this is going to be called the Diet of Worms. You're like, well, I'm supposed to write this down. I do that all the time. Okay, the Diet of Worms. Worms, actually, it's German. Why can't they just speak American like everybody else? Would have been so much easier. <coughs> Charles V had become the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. Charles V. He wore many crowns. He was the head of the most powerful dynastic family in Europe. He was a Habsburg. Charles V. 
And what he established was an imperial diet, which is an imperial, almost what they call it, be a court, where a ruling is going to be made. But Charles V was an absolutely amazing man. He is going to have the largest empire in existence, at least in the West. That is the empire of Charles V. He would become, or he was, the descendant of Ferdinand and Isabella and got Spain, the Habsburg dynasty there. But the Habsburgs were also in Austria. And when his uncle died, he got Austria. And then, using the power of Austria within the Holy Roman Empire, he got, there are seven of the biggest principalities in the Holy Roman Empire pick their emperor. They're called electors. There's over a thousand city-states and principalities in the Holy Roman Empire at this time. But seven choose. And he made sure, with a lot of money, that they chose him as emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. Now, it's not like he had ironclad or iron rule over the empire, but he still controlled a lot. Austria is right here, the richest and biggest part of the Holy Roman Empire. It also had this part of Italy and Spain. But if you had Spain, what else did he have? Hmm? Say it again. New Spain in the New World. New Spain goes from Argentina all the way up to just about to where, well, heck, into Oregon. He had Mexico. He had all of Central America. And he had all the gold that came with that. He also had Florida, islands of the Caribbean, the Philippines, colonies all over <coughs> Africa. Charles V is going to control much of the world. He's going to have more money he knew what to do with. And the problem is, he's incredibly overextended. He controls all this area, and he has real enemies. The Ottomans. So we have to get that down. The Ottomans were contesting with the Spain, the Spanish, for not only controlling the Mediterranean, but the Ottomans are pushing this way. There are two cities on the Danube, Buda and Pesht. Now it's Budapest. Everyone says pest because we speak American, but it's Budapest. Great place, but it's hot. What else are the average temperature? 500,000 degrees. That's what it felt like. It was hot. But Budapest. And they're pushing this way. History's got an enemy pushing this way. And then the traditional enemy of the Habsburg, the French. And the French are pushing out in all directions. Contesting for uh, Italy, we've already talked about this in the Renaissance, intriguing in here, Charles V has enemies, and Charles V does not want more enemies within the empire. If parts of the empire go to Luther, he might lose his power there. Charles V might have more money than anybody else in the world, but he's spending it faster than anybody else in the world, too. And he's really worried. He's got enemies. So he can't, this is what we have to get. He can't make more enemies within the empire. If he makes more enemies, AKA, really, really, that's the second time I said AKA, don't ever let me do that again. <laughs> he really is worried about being too harsh on Luther. If he's too harsh on Luther, he will alienate some of the princes in Germany that are now becoming what we would call Lutheran. And now he has enemy within, while fighting the French and the Ottomans, because soon would go through a 20-year war with the French and the Ottomans. And so, back, oh, by the way, I want to show you that picture. This is why you, this is why inbreeding is bad. That's what Charles V looked like. And I want to be very clear about this. They made him look better than what he probably looked. So he had this massive chin, this huge nose, because, well, inbreeding, inbreeding look, makes everybody look like a horse. Have you ever seen Prince Charles of England? Inbreeding. 
Okay, we're finishing this tomorrow. I would like you to read it. I have no idea what you're doing. Yeah, well, I should say nation. And so, this is pretty good. Like, it's a nation. But I said to name it all. And so, what I will do is, I'll give you an opportunity to read you. So, you want to come in? Okay, well, okay. So, we can nation to each other. It's going to be like five minutes, 20 bucks. Oh, yes. Okay. Right out. That's not okay. But what I really want you to do is this is fine, but for parts we're doing. But, um, oh, for purposes. Okay, so he, they wrote it, but. Here, we don't give them any real specific historical content. So, what I'd like to do is just add a couple of stories. No big deal. Thank you. I forgot to hand it out last week, so I didn't kind of refresh my memory. Sorry. That Charles Fifth was a good looking guy. Oh, this is an even better one. You want to see why inbreeding of monarchs is bad? You want to see it? Yeah, let's do it. That. Look at that. Yeah. That's why you should not marry your cousin. Yeah. I, I do. That's true.